Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, the Black Woman Animator, coming back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Goro Fujita. Welcome. Hey, Deborah. How's it going? Good. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah. So, my name is Goro Fujita. I'm an art director and animator. Um, I've been, I started my career working more like uh, an animator first, and then I transitioned to VizDev, uh, visual development art director, and now I kind of create VR prototypes. We can get into it later. But um, yeah, that's what I do, and that's who I am. Nice. Um, so you were born in Japan and grew up in Hamburg, uh, Germany. So can you talk about growing up as a kid? Mm, you know about me. <laughs> that's <laughs> Just that's a great. Bit. <laughs> yeah, that, that's good. Um, yeah, so I was born in Japan, but moved with my family to Germany when I was two and a half years old. And uh, so I didn't really live in Japan. Um, so I grew up bilingual. Um, German is actually, my German is better than my Japanese, actually, I have to admit. Um, but spoke uh, with my parents Japanese and went to German high school and German mm -hmm. elementary in high school. Um, my family is like a super musical family like uh, my my dad was a uh, uh, horn player in the hamburg symphonic orchestra which is why he also moved to germany and my brother was like super talented in uh, music always right so i got dragged into that early on where I was learning piano and stuff like that, and um, and trumpet. I played the trumpet. Um, yeah, trumpet players. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, my my brother was always kind of. He's four years older, and mm -hmm. I have only one brother, and um, he kind of, you know, he was always better. Not just a bit, but a lot better in terms of like music. Mm -hmm. So you know, and the, the expectations were high, but then you know. I don't want to be as a little brother. I didn't want to be in the shadow of my older brother, right? Mm -hmm. So I was basically trying to see, trying to find something where I could be better than him. <laughs> and um, certainly it wasn't music. I tried, you know, but uh, he was the kind of guy, you know, who can just listen to a song. Like we, we watch, like, for example, we watch MacGyver on TV, right? And he can play this theme song right away. Oh. He can create its own arrangement on the spot, right? And... <laughs> I was so jealous about that stuff because I'm like, how do you do this, right? And it sounds just like it, you know, but it doesn't sound like a cheap version of it. It sounds right. like a real song. So I said, like, yeah, I'm not going to catch up to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I started drawing a lot. So I, I draw, drew all my life. Um, and, you know, like also in elementary school, I was always the creative guy, right? Mm -hmm. And not paying attention. My grades were super bad, right? Because I would I would just draw all day, and you know, but my brother was really good at that too, which kind of sucked, <laughs> right? So I didn't like that, but but you know, at least there was some hope. Like he yeah. was four years ahead, but it wasn't as like hopeless as with music, you know. So um, I kept doing music on the side, but my passion grew towards animation. So uh, drawing first, not animation. But um, yeah. early on, I realized that I do want to do something as a career in, ter in graphic design or something like that. So when you look at those, um, I don't know if you guys had that here in the States, but in Germany, we had this um, thing called Poesie album, which is like, like a little kind of diary type of book mm -hmm. um, that you pass along to your classmates and they can write something nice about you or something. You know, I don't know how to yeah, call like it here in the States. Yearbook. Yeah, yeah, kind of, but it's, it's more personal. You know, okay. like not everybody has it, you know, and okay. and it's like a personal album. Mm -hmm. And um, there's also some templates where like, who do you want to be? What's your favorite musician and stuff like that? And I always wrote graphic designer, mm -hmm. not knowing what that really means. But I thought that sounds really cool. Right. So I want to be a graphic designer. Yeah. And um, yeah, so um, late in high school, I kept drawing and stuff. And then I started feeling like, hey, there's, there's something else. There's like also animation. I like to make things move, right? Yeah. And so all my class books, they had, like, I used the flip books, the edge of the book mm -hmm. to draw some like wrestling matches or stick figures, you know. And then at the end of the year, when we had to return the books, I had to like erase them all one uh, by one. Oh, it's good that you did it in pencil. Yeah, yeah. But you see the shadow, right? So I got like in trouble with that but um <laughs> i really loved that stuff like animation and stuff and then senior year of high school i first got in touch with 3d and mm -hmm. um that was kind of like kind of talking about my career i should be talking more about my childhood right no, <laughs> oh, is that keep okay? Going, keep going, keep going. okay cool <laughs> um because <laughs> it's gonna be long but um yeah so 
maybe I talk a little bit about also um, the environment I grew up in because um, I was in a German school and um, my brother actually had it pretty hard because he moved to Germany when he was six. Mm -hmm. So he was fluent in Japanese but couldn't speak a word German. Mm -hmm. So when he got into class, he like he could actually not understand anything. So my mom used to go with him into class and my mom couldn't speak German. So she actually learned German through elementary school and TV pretty impressive right yeah but by the time i went to uh, elementary school and like i was two and a half when i um when i was in germany right and then so by the time i was ready to go to elementary school i was actually fluent in german mm -hmm. so i had it much easier than my brother because he kind of paved the way yeah but um germany especially hamburg not many people know this but hamburg is actually the second biggest city in germany mm -hmm. after berlin and um but big meaning size of san francisco right like 1.82 million um population or something but it's, it's a good size right mm -hmm. but back then you know there was still the berlin wall as well right so it was not very international at all i was the only asian in my class right <laughs> so um that's how i grew up in you know so i i do understand what it means to be the minority you know and i of course i experienced a fair amount of racism as well you know where you know they do like this ching chong chong you know yeah. <laughs> and, and there's there's the saying in german it's called ching chong chong chinesen sind so dumm and that means that ching chong chong chinese are so dumb <laughs> it's stupid oh. right yeah. <laughs> but, but um that stuff sticks with you, right? Yeah. Like, like you're yeah. so young and you don't understand why people are so mean to you and why they pick on you when, when you look different, right? Yeah. And, um, and also when I, I play ping pong, ping pong was very popular in elementary school and early high school. Mm -hmm. Like I go to a club, you know, to, to go to training. And then my first day, like everybody's like loud screaming, you know, playing. And then I entered the gym. <laughs> And everybody stops talking and they just stare at me, right? Yeah. Pretty terrifying. So um, that stuff, you know, like I got used to, but I, that was kind of the normal for me, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, I only had a few encounters that were a little bit scary, you know, with mm -hmm. skinheads and stuff like that. But I um, never got into like real fights and stuff. So um, pretty like, I would say like good, normal childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but not un, like it's subconsciously knowing that i was something different you know i yeah. came from a different background but i also went to um the japanese uh school every okay. saturday so i had, I had six days of school right five days german school one day japanese school and Asian. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then in the japanese school i was kind of an outsider too together with the other japanese german people you know because they were split into like the people that were um, going to German school during the week and Japanese school on weekends and the people that only went to Japanese school, okay. right? So they could barely speak German, right? Because they, they went to this called international school where they had some English lessons and stuff like that, but it was like all Japanese, right? Okay. So they looked at us like, oh, those are the German <laughs> Japanese. <laughs> they can't even speak Japanese properly, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like an interesting um, yeah. um, way to grow, grow up, right? Like where I didn't find like acceptance in Japan, but also no in Germany, right? It felt right. like, but um, <clears throat> I felt comfortable with it. I never felt like, oh, this is horrible or anything. I never felt like I need to get away from here or something. So it didn't really affect me in a way that it was conscious. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So um, back to like uh, getting into high school, you know, um, that was my normal. But but later in high school, um, it was like, you know, in the late 90s, I would say, you know, it, it became more and more international. So um, Germany, as you know, is like very um, foreigner friendly, so immigrant friendly, right? They let everyone in, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so it was a lot of people from Europe right like less Asians but let's say um, out of 90 students we were six Asians by the okay. end of high school right so um, it was like five Koreans and one Japanese which was me <laughs> and then um, and then a lot of people from like you know some some Dutch people some from Finland Scandinavia you know um, and like the surroundings Turkey and stuff like that mm -hmm. so it's, it's it was pretty mixed you know um, so um, yeah in, in senior high school that's when when um toy story came out 1995 right and mm -hmm. i watched toy story and i was like 
Jesus Christ, this is crazy. Like, what is this, right? This yeah. is like, I've never seen something like this. And before then, I grew up watching Disney movies, right? Yeah, I watched yeah. them like on loop, right? I, for example, Hercules, Tarzan, I watched like nine, 12 times, you know, <laughs> just because I was so fascinated with animation. And yeah, in 95, when I saw Toy Story, I was like, this, this is a new world. This is something crazy, right? Yeah. But it felt so far away. I was like super intrigued what that is and um, one got really interested in this, but then I didn't know where to start. I didn't know what it was, right? Like, right. I mean, it doesn't look hand-drawn, but it, what, what is this thing? You know, what does 3D mean? And then um, in 1999, um, this animation came out called Alien Song, created by Victor Navone, mm -hmm. who became a Pixar animator, actually, because of that animation, right? You probably know that animation of, yeah. like, the screen alien singing, I will survive, right? <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, that was just, like, when I saw that, and there was also another short film that created a very big impact on me was Killer Bean from Jeff Liu, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, like, those coffee beans that are dancing, and they, they have the Matrix homage in there. And those are the two movies that short films that really paved my way into animation because I was like, I think the reason was it looked like it was made by a single person. So it felt approachable. It felt like I, I, I felt like I could do this, you know, mm -hmm. versus like Toy Story felt like way too crazy. It was so far away from what I knew. Yeah. So that's when I started researching what 3D was mm -hmm. and started like getting really interested in like what is the software like how do i get this and stuff like that right so there was a few 3d magazines back then in germany and i would just buy them and subscribe to them and stuff you know of course not myself i asked my mom can i subscribe to <laughs> <laughs> no. and um yeah and that's how i actually uh, got the first taste of uh, 3d and um that's basically um what basically formed this graphic designer which i used to write in the template into like animator i yeah. was like this is something this is this is it you know <laughs> this is something i want to i want to do for the rest of my life right so that's kind of like my backstory childhood to the beginning of my professional career mm -hmm. um shall i yeah. keep going or do you have no, questions like, um, <laughs> i feel like how you okay so like your thing with your brother is kind of similar to like me playing video games and like i have a twin brother and Ooh, nice. he would spend so much time on the video games and then i would like opt in and and then you know the, the little wrestling game where he would just like pin me in a corner and beat me up and i'm like okay i will <laughs> i never want to dedicate the time to get good enough to compete with him to so beat I, him <laughs> i just will not play video games <laughs> i'll yeah, have it's to go over my cousin's house and play sonic <laughs> <laughs> nice <laughs> on sega genesis but, um, oh, that's old school. I love it. And then um, I feel like what you're feeling with your brother with the music is like probably how everybody else feels with, with you with VR. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> like, how are you doing this? <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like he was like your like mentor for like excellence. <laughs> <laughs> the, the good thing is, you know, like if I carry on with the story, like actually we come together later on where we work Ooh. together, you know, on short oh, films I and stuff, that. which is really cool. Yes. What would you say some of your best childhood memories are? That's a good question. Um, I think, you know, these days, I think it's not very common that people, you know, let the kids just walk by themselves outside at night and, mm -hmm. you know, into the forest and stuff like that, right? Like, then people call the cops on you right away. Yeah. <laughs> um, but growing up, I was like living close to the Ulster River and um, there was like walking distance and um, we used to go there. My, my parents were like pretty, you know, chill about <laughs> us yeah. going anywhere, you know, and they, they actually forced us to walk to school alone, you know, mm -hmm. and they're like, I show you the way one more time. So pay attention because you, <laughs> you're going to be on your own. Right. So yeah. we were very. Um, independent in that way right yeah. i was like way more dependent on my parents than my brother because my brother kind of like was the bigger guy he needs needed to always be stronger than me so i always preferred to tag along with him like when we get like for example in the morning it's very common in german to eat like buns and bread with spreads and stuff like that right yeah. so we buy the bread fresh so the baker and uh, bakery is like two miles away or something right so my parents say, say get get some bread right and then i'm like i don't want to go alone and then, <laughs> you know, and i would always tag along but um 
basically they let us play in the forest and stuff like that even by the river we would climb trees and it's pretty crazy right um yeah. if you think about it now it should be normal you right, know it yeah it should be but it's times have changed and i'm sure on the countryside it's still like that you know mm -hmm. um but um these days people are so paranoid with social media yeah. and you know and because there's too much information about bad bad situations and stuff like that right mm -hmm. so um i think my great memories as a childhood is you know playing in the forest you know and like building some boats uh, with um always something creative right building yeah. boats out of leaves and just letting them down letting them float on the river and then chase them on the on land right and um, climbing over trees there's like a fallen tree over the river you know and there's a memory where i almost fell in i could barely hang on to it because i got too cocky you know i was hanging yeah. off it and you know my brother had to save me there that's like one of the cool memories and then we had like these um toys called um mini 4wd so four wheel drive mm -hmm. um they were like very popular in japan during the 80s you know and they they i think they came over to the states too at some point but mm -hmm. um they were basically little kits that you built together and um you can modify the motors and stuff yeah. like that almost like an rc car but um it's not an rc car you turn it on and you have to chase it right <laughs> yeah. but um you could buy like crazy motors that they go like 30 miles per hour and it's like this little thing so as a kid you can't even chase it right, <laughs> right. so once you turn it on it just <laughs> goes and then it shatters in a wall or something right but um we had tons of these like yeah. every time yeah, one one thing I forgot to say is every summer we would go back to Japan because our our relatives were all in Japan, mm -hmm. and um, that's when we buy all that stuff. Right? Yeah. <laughs> because in Germany there was like almost zero import of toys and even sweets and oh. candy and stuff from like international stuff was not common at all. Right mm -hmm. now here in the states, for example, if I go to like a Nijia market or something, I can find everything what you can buy in Japan. Yeah. But that was not the case in the 80s, you know, and 90s. So um, it was always like this shopping spree. Whenever we go <laughs> to Japan, you know, I grab my grandma and I'm grandma, let's go because I knew that she buys me a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. And that's when we came back with a lot of toys, you know, mm -hmm. we also had the soft air guns, you know, like with the BB guns and stuff like that. And my brother was like hardcore into, you know, and mm -hmm. those, those like, didn't exist in Germany. Right. right. So, um, yeah, so we, we would modify these cars and take them into the forest, you know, and do some photo shoots of like create like stories, like almost like Mad Max, you know, like how the cars are driving. And we create these explosions mm -hmm. literally with like, um, what, what do you call these um, firecrackers? In, yeah. Right. Like, yeah. so we would break them and get that gunpowder out. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so dangerous. <yeah. laughs> and we would like collect all of them and put them in the. You, do you remember um, and in the the camera film capsules? Yeah. That, mm -hmm. Right. So we would mm -hmm. put the gunpowder in there to have a lot. Right. <laughs> and then we would put, pour it on top of branches and stuff and we just light it on fire and we take photos, you know, <laughs> and then it looks like the cars are driving through explosions. And when, when I think about it, you know, like my parents didn't know, you know, but it's so <laughs> it's crazy stuff. Like as that, long right? as you came back with all your fingers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Actually, I lost one finger. That's a different story, though. <laughs> we can come to that later. <laughs> Not in the childhood. This was actually uh, 2017, and so much more recent. But um, anyway, um, that I think that was really cool. We had our neighbors, who are childhood friends, we're still in touch with, um, like sister and brother and mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of like i almost consider them my siblings you know um she's one year younger her brother was one year older than my brother so we were like we called the gang called prcg you know so it was like patrick Ryosuke, my brother christine and goro right yeah. prcg and we created those ids and stuff like that you nice know? And then we, I still have the photo ID. It's like a photo and it has like characteristics. <laughs> and I mean, then, that's what childhood was about. <laughs> yeah. And then one of the favorite games we used to play is um, Fall Guy, right? So we, Fall Guy was one of the um, series from America that made it overseas. You know, I, um, of course, Knight Rider and MacGyver as well. But Fall Guy was like one of the early ones. And uh, I don't know if you remember Fall Guy, but it's mm -hmm. about, so it's like stuntmen, right? So okay. it's a series about stuntmen and it's kind of like this cheesy 
story always, right? Um, and there's like a female and two guys, Howie and Cody, you know, <laughs> and Jody is the female. So um, we used to, we loved stunts. That was so cool. So uh, we had a big garden. So we, we used to like jump off trees and stuff, pretending, you know, one is Colt, one is Howie, you know, and, and not Cody. Yeah, it was Colt and Howie. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, Cody is a different um, <laughs> series. But um, then, so we were four, right? PRCG. So, of course, the oldest, Patrick, he wanted to be um, uh, Colt, who is the main guy, right? My brother was obviously Howie, and of course, Christine was Jody. So, who am I, right? So, they made a name of called Mick. So, you're Mick. <laughs> yeah, I was like his fourth wheel. You know? And I was like, but I want to be called. You know? so, so, sometimes, you know, we, we had role changes where one person could be called and he was yeah, the leader nice. and stuff. And, you know, Sharing we used to caring. like. Yeah, and we used to like. You know, there was like this wooden fence, so we would like stand on top, and then one guy rides with a like tricycle underneath the fence, and then we would jump over and think that's a cool stunt, you know. <laughs> and then always we take photos, right? Yeah. Like there was like always that about like getting really good shots, you know, and pretending we're like the superheroes there. So I think that was probably the most valuable thing that I really cherish about our childhood that we, we grew up in a really good environment and um, mm -hmm. they are actually also French German so they were like um, very open you know open-minded mm -hmm. people our other neighbors on the other side we had like we were in a town home with two adjacent mm -hmm. homes we were in the center and the other family was Turkish and mm -hmm. so it was like a very international you know um, environment so it was like it felt really comfortable and yeah it's it's crazy to think that uh, Christine has now th two kids or three kids, I think. It's, it's pretty crazy, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting to listen to you talk about your childhood and see how, like, oh, you were, like, working on composition and, like, and yeah. visual, like, uh, special visual effects. effects. And, like, <laughs> like, it was, like, so much, it just was, like, innately, like, you were, like, destined to be, like, a filmmaker. <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of when I think back, you know, yeah, we always wanted to create stories and then, mm -hmm. Now you remind me that we another fun memory I had is like we got my dad was kind of in, he's not a tech guy right mm -hmm. but um he also was interested in creation he's a creative right because he's in music mm -hmm. so he actually had a super 8 camera before I was born so he was just film with it and I I got the I found the film rolls later on and I actually digitized them and it's amazing like his skill of composition and how how he recorded stuff yeah. like without even seeing a screen right it's just like a, it yeah. rolls with a gun right with <laughs> and, and you just hear this rattling but you can't really well you can see through the visor but that that's that's about it right yeah but um beautiful shots and um so he was interested in capturing life right so he always had a nice camera he was a nikon guy right um so i was nikon for a while until i switched to sony because sony is better in video <laughs> <laughs> right and yeah. videography and stuff but um yeah, so he, he basically um, definitely got me interested in photography and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then early on, so we, we kind of leapfrogged VHS. So we did have VHS videos and stuff, of course, tons of them. And mm -hmm. we had a player, but we didn't have a VHS recorder because they were like huge, yeah. right? Because of the um, tapes. But he, we, were, we got one of the first high 8 cameras, right? Mm -hmm. Which was like the smaller, almost like cassette tapes, you know, that yeah. size. And then my brother and I went berserk on that stuff, right? And um, that's when we first started stop motion, actually. So mm -hmm. um, we, we did some, you know, stop motion with like, um, what, what is it called here? The Kinder Surprise, the egg, the chocolate. Is it, is it Kinder Surprise or something um. like that? I'm not, about, I'm not sure what it's called in the states, but yeah, I'm, so, I'm sure people know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I think it was illegal for a while here, right? I don't know why. I think it was because it's too many small pieces oh, yeah, or the, something. It was right? like stars or something. Or? Well, there's always like a surprise capsule in there yeah. with like model kits or figurines. Yeah. And in Germany, there was like this huge thing, right? Like there was like always this treat for kids because yeah. you can shake it and hear kind of if it's a figurine or a model kit, you know, and mm -hmm. everybody wanted always the figurines. So you see like in the supermarkets, people shaking it. Like, ah, <laughs> no, not this one. 
maybe this one, right? And and um, that's something. Um, and we I collected these as a kid, these figurines, and then we we're like, hey, I remember they had like this crocodile, crocodile themed, um, you know, uh, figurines. They would do break dance and stuff like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So you see one crocodile in a back spin position. So we would just rotate it, you know. And the way we did stop motion back then is you, you just hit record and stop. Beep, beep. Beep, 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 right? So mm -hmm. we put the camera on a tripod and then we would just click, click, and then I would animate and my brother's like, tick, tick, okay, next, tick, tick, click, and then we watched it and we were like, oh, this is amazing, right? <laughs> and of course, also with Lego, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, and thinking about it early on, I was actually really, like, yeah, I never realized that actually until now that I was actually animating much sooner than, you know, I thought, right? So... Um, those are like the first childhood memories where that really paved the way to wh who I am today, I think. I saw some pictures of you. Did you break dance? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I have a lot of um, different <laughs> passions. You know, my brother was into combat. Like, he really loved martial arts. So we watched Jackie Chan movies, like, you know, back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. But then combat was something, you know... I. I wanted to be able to do, but then I didn't want to really practice. And my, my brother went to training and stuff like that. He learned Eskrema and Nunchucks and stuff, you know. <laughs> and while he brought it home and he would just practice it on me and I'm like super weak, right? So I was always saying like, hey, one day when I'm taller and stronger than you, I'm going to mess you up, right? right? So that was always the thing. But then when I got taller and stronger, <laughs> I was rationally too adult, so I'm like, oh, whatever, man, <laughs> forget about it. But um, so I was interested in combat because that's what my brother was like super into. But then, then I really started watching like Michael Jackson and stuff like that, right? And I remember like when I saw Michael Jackson, I think it's was the Jam Jam tour. Mm -hmm. I was just like, it, I was just in awe. It's like this guy is insane right like i want to be able to dance like that so i remember like trying to um learn the moves from michael you know and we had we had like this this crappy vhs recording mm -hmm. from a concert that we recorded from tv and yeah. my my parents didn't have cable right it was all antenna so <laughs> the channels were horrible they had like this crazy interference you know so we had the recording of that Mm -hmm. And then um, we had like this advanced VHS player with the jog shuttle, so yeah. I can just change the speed. So I would, I actually learned the side sideways moonwalk. I don't know what the name of it when you slide, yeah, um, yeah. yeah sideways. That move. I copied from Michael Jackson, you know, uh -huh. and I can still do it. Never one is like once you figure it out, you, you're good, you, you, you're good, right? You yeah. know how to do it. But then um, I was like, this is really cool, you know. I want to learn how to pop and stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. And then, but YouTube wasn't a thing back then, so yeah. I was just there. Like, Michael Jackson is all I had, you know. So, um, and then I think in the late '90s we got internet, mm -hmm. right? So we were like one of the first. I would say like one of the few people that had internet in the late 90s uh, in my friend circle, right? Yeah. It was like the 28,000 baud modem, really slow, <laughs> right? But, and with a, we had AOL. Yeah. And um, the funny thing is, you know, like in Germany, you actually pay landline okay. by minute. Or mm -hmm. I don't know how it is now. And now everybody has cell phones. But back then it was like, you actually pay by minute, even if it's local calls, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, that was the thing, right? <laughs> and, and then you pay minutes for AOL as well. Mm -hmm. So if you add that up, it was like six dollars per hour, mm -hmm. which is which is very expensive, right? Yeah. So they had, um, and it was like about a dollar for the phone line, and then I think five dollars for the internet, right? And so back then, AOL had those promotions, um, fifty hours free, mm -hmm. right? So basically, you only had to pay the phone line. But what they did is, you know, the, there's computer magazines that you can get in the store yeah they had like the cd-rom yeah. on there right <laughs> and they had a code on there mm -hmm. which you can use a registration code that you can use to get the 50 hours free mm -hmm. and so i got one of those magazines and i used the 50 hours really quickly you know because i loved the internet you know um back then we had CompuServe and aol right? mm -hmm. <laughs> and <clears throat> i remember like <laughs> 
after the like i was like i can't keep buying these magazines that's not scalable right <laughs> so man i just went into the kiosk and write down the registration <laughs> codes and i would just use them at home oh. totally messed up you know but that's how i i got cheap internet you know yeah. but, um, but then i was regulated by my parents because <laughs> still the phone phone bill went up you know yeah but um i remember like really like you know surfing the internet i created my own website early on you know so that was like way before youtube and then but then i don't know if you remember this uh, service called napster yep so yeah so napster became popular and that's also how i actually got alien song in 99 Right? Oh, because nice. there was no YouTube, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's how I uh, was able to find it and Killer Bean and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I was looking for more content like that, but it qu- didn't exist. It was Jeff Lou and Victor Navone, period. Those mm-hmm. were the guys, you know, and everything else looked like crap, you know. And there was a few tutorials online. There was this modeling tutorial of mm-hmm. this gnome in NURBS in 3D Studio Max. That was yeah. like a very popular one, you know. Yeah. So... And then for me, it was like, how do I, what was actually the question? Because I break completely dance. said, ah, breakdance. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's bring it back. Yeah. So, um, that's when I also started finding like super low quality, um, dance videos, mm-hmm. right. And from the flying steps, the Germans, right. The Germans were really good. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and, um, yeah, so with B-Boy Storm, and so they paved the way, right? Mm-hmm. And but that, that, and then I tried to learn the six step and stuff like that, you know. But I didn't know any technique. Yeah. And so basically, um, I kind of like tried to practice, but I never took it seriously. And in Germany, there was no, not that I knew of, like breakdance schools. Like mm-hmm. what, what's popular in Germany is in senior high school or middle school or something. Probably senior high school. Everybody takes ballroom dancing classes. That's a very common thing to do. So that's like, everybody does it, right? So mm-hmm. you sign up and then you go and that's where you meet the girls and stuff <laughs> like that. You know, girls meet the guys there. So I know how to ballroom dance for that. So I took like um, the novice class and the advanced class, you know, and then you can go to silver, gold and platinum, but I only did the advanced one. Yeah. So I learned like how to dance cha-cha, rumba, tango and stuff like oh. that and waltz, right? But then, you know, they had some parties every now and then. So that, that dance, dance school, right? Because the dance school goes for like three months or something, you know, mm-hmm. once every week. And they, they would do parties. And that, that's like before you can go to a disco club, right? Yeah. <laughs> so because we're like still 16 or 15 years old. Mm-hmm. And then there was a guy who was like basically doing his like body waves and stuff. And I'm like whoa this is awesome right and then i started practicing it too and i i i also saw a video about the windmill how to do a windmill you know but it wasn't a real tutorial so i was just trying to like swing my legs around you know super bad technique and just got bruised and stuff like that it never worked but then fast forward a few years later um a youtube video youtube came out right and then there was a guy called invent fmc Mm-hmm. Um, he lives in LA now, actually, and uh, Asad Invent Conley, and he basically, um, I watched a video of him, and he shows how to pop, like how to hit, create hits, you know, by yeah. clinching the fists and stuff like that, and basically he shows off like his hits, you know, like how he does the popping, and I'm like, this is really good instruction, right? So I got a little bit more towards popping now, you know, okay. and 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 animation and stuff where you do these type of frame yeah. by frame movements and so so I loved and stuff so I got into popping and really trained that and then fast forward a few years later I came to the states right in 2008 mm-hmm. and that's kind of like my dance segue right now but because that's a really good story too by the way <laughs> so um I came to the states you know and then um we went to this thing called sketch crawl you might be familiar with mm-hmm. enrico casarosa started that from pixar a long time ago and it, it, basically the idea is like people concept artists animators they meet in a public location and then you sketch for a day and then you come back regroup and you show each other your sketches so it's like yeah. this community event right so i started going to those in the states first year i came here in 2008 and then we, we see a guy who is like with a sketchbook, you know, but he's waiting for his coffee and he's like doing these crazy moves like wh- while he's standing in line, right? And my friend Erwin Madrid, um, mm-hmm. who's an amazing artist as well, he was like, 
I know, I, I think I know this guy. I think this is Joe. Like he was always into dance and he was at the Academy of Art University with me. You know? uh -huh. And I'm like, let me talk to this guy. And then he said, oh, Irvin, you know? So he said, yeah, this is Goro, my friend and stuff. And like, what do you do? And he's like, oh yeah, I dance and blah, blah, blah. You know? And I'm like, you dance? And then we talked about this and he showed me like those crazy moves, yeah. um, like, like the Ewok. Do you know the Ewok? So, I probably could, if I saw it. Yeah, so basically, apparently the origin of the Ewok is because of the Star Wars Ewoks. Mm -hmm. When they walk over the tree, it looks really weird. Like, because it was like, I think they were on wires or something like that. Yeah. And then it's like um, a step where you do the, the oh, feet, yeah. where you shuffle the feet like this, right? Mm -hmm. And it looks like you're gliding above... And, and then your arms are like out and you, your legs go crazy, you know, and mm -hmm. basically he showed me that and I'm like, this is insane. You're like so good. And I was like, can you break dance too? And he's like, yeah, I did that, but I'm more into turf dancing. Right. Okay. So that's, that's like his thing. And he grew up in Richmond. So he was like the only agent among black people and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, and he's like, I'm, I'm trying to keep the kids off the streets. So I'm teaching dance. And I was like, that's super inspiring. Right. Mm -hmm. So he said, hey, you know, you guys want to come to a party tonight? You know, there's at the Minna Gallery in San Francisco, there's like a cool party. There's a lot of cool dancers coming tonight, you know, and I'm like, uh, yes, let's do it. <laughs> right? And then we finish sketch crawl and then we go to the Mission District uh, and then go to the Minna Gallery. It's like an art gallery, but they change it into like a club sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. a bit sketchy area, you know, but <laughs> that's standard, right? right. And then, and then, um, there's this uh, guy dancing outside, you know, doing some pop, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, that's my f my friend, Assad, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh, cool. I walk up to him, you know, and he's like, hey, cool. And so where are you from? And I'm like, I, I just, just moved from Germany, actually, right? Um, just like in August and found a job here and, you know, enjoying my life here. And he's like, oh, that's cool. Like, and then he switches to German, right? <laughs> so he's a black guy in San Francisco random dance guy that i met starts speaking german and he's like my grandma told me and taught me german so i actually know german and i'm just like i was like so perplexed and i couldn't yeah i couldn't actually speak german i kept speaking english to him because my brain was like this doesn't what is going on right and i'm like i kept saying like where did you learn and yeah my grandma taught me and you know i never actually lived in germany and blah and i'm just like oh, oh what is going on right like it's super confused and then anyway i was like this is awesome you know and then he's like do you dance and like, i like dance i wouldn't say i can dance right and he said yeah we're gonna have fun so we go in there there's a lot of people from the dance community that mm -hmm. i wasn't in yet right and then they create like the circles and it's like legit stuff you know it's <laughs> not just like drunk people dancing and right. i'm just like oh this is this is they're good, you know. <laughs> and then Asar is like, Goro, come into the circle. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> he said, like, come in, you, you're fine, right? And then I was like, okay, who cares? I go in and do something, <laughs> robot, robot, and I left, you know. And he's like, dude, that was okay, right? It's about having fun. Yeah. Right? Nobody cares. And I was just like drenched in sweat because I was nervous, not because yeah. I was exercising, you know, but but that was kind of the first time it exposed me to like, you know, dance here in the States. Right. Yeah. And I really loved the community. They were like super nice to me. You know, and and um, then at the end of the night, he was just like, um, yeah, check out my YouTube channel in event FMC, you know, and then I'm like, oh, OK, go home. And first thing I do is YouTube channel. And guess what? It's the video I learned from. Oh, <laughs> right. That's crazy, right? So it was that guy that taught me how to pop. So I texted him right away, dude, Assad, you can't, I can't believe this. I learned from you in Germany, like years ago, like two years ago. And now I actually, what are the odds that I meet you in person, right? So um, he actually became my teacher later because I went to a dance studio to mm -hmm. properly learn how to break dance. And mm -hmm. um, I learned from uh miles uh Kennedy. he's like a he was with a re renegade rockers crew and mm -hmm. um i think he's now in the fashion business he doesn't dance anymore but super good teacher so i learned from him and i also learned <clears throat> sometimes uh cricket she's michelle cricket she's um she brought break dance for female up here in the bay area you know mm -hmm. so she, she um she founded the sisters of the underground the crew you know and so nice. basically 
um, I learned from her too. And um, like Miles and uh, Cricket, they would butt battle together as a, you know, as a group to, with others and stuff. I was always in awe to see them battle. I never went to official battles because I never got good enough, you know. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> and I was also a little bit old to start with. I started to be more serious about it when I was 28, 29, right? So yeah. you need like serious muscles to <laughs> do break dance. So um, yeah, so when I went to city dance in San Francisco, <clears throat> I was like basically learning how to break dance for miles. But then Erwin, my artist friend, he was also interested in dance, but he wouldn't, didn't want to do break dance. He wanted like popping. Yeah. So we also started taking popping classes together. So I would go twice a week from San Mateo to San Francisco, which is like 45 minutes drive, you know, after work, we would right. go, you know, to dance and stuff. And then guess what? Assad becomes a teacher there for popping, you know. So first it was the um, uh, different guy. Um, what's his name? Boy Wonder from Soul Sector, you know, mm -hmm. and, and like you, you know, these names from like America's Best Dance Crew and stuff yeah. like that and seeing them like actually teach it's pretty amazing right so I, and and boy wonder was like really talented and um we learned from him like for about a year but then he quit teaching and then Assad became a teacher <laughs> so i'm actually learning from Assad, which was like crazy and then i ended up creating his promo video shooting and editing it for his website later on right so it all came full circle you know and then um yeah while i was learning from miles um that's when i learned how to do the windmill i was able to do it you know i tried to learn the flare but then that put too much pressure on my wrist and i didn't want to risk it you know yeah. so you know, I got to a point where I could dance in a circle in the club, you know, but power moves is basically windmill was the only one that I only thing that I could do. Mm -hmm. And even one of the entry power moves, right? But mm -hmm. it's still so hard. <laughs> it took me like one year to learn. And um, but that was like around that time I was in my best fitness. Absolutely. Right. right? Because I would like practice every day in the morning at the dreamworks gym actually you know uh -huh. and then at night i would go practice with them right so that's when i um met a lot of like other dancers you know like famous guy iron monkey right like he mm -hmm. probably doesn't remember me anymore but <laughs> i would like basically dance with on the same in the same gym with them you know so that was really cool and i actually also met lee twins right so oh, the twins oh, yeah nice. so because um um sandy who owned um city dance mm -hmm. she had a good um good connection with the twins right so um she conducted workshops they would come from france to conduct yeah. workshops like two-day workshops and i actually took a workshop with them nice. way before they became famous with world oh, of wow. dance right mm -hmm. so i have a picture with them where they're like <laughs> next to me that's super tall and intimidating and <laughs> also they're always in character that's I say in character, but that's probably who they are. But they're kind of intimidating because they're like always like so intense, you know. Yeah. And then when we do the dance class, they split our groups into two. One mm -hmm. is like one twin, the other twin, right? And then they battle each other. My group is better and stuff like yeah. that. It's like a show, right? And I was just like amazed by it. There's still a YouTube video of that class where you see me like clumsily dancing in the background, you know, because I was like kind of in the middle, but then I slowly moved to the back yeah. because all the kids picked up all the moves so fast, yeah. the choreography, you know, and I'm just like, oh, what do I, what do? I do? <laughs> it's too fast. And um, yeah, I looked super stiff. So yeah, I, picking and you up can choreography see is like a skill in it itself. Like, it I is. Know for me, it I'm is. very, I don't know, I'm not a natural dancer. I'm very like, okay, where does my elbow go? Okay, mm -hmm. where, like, I'm like, so I would have to, it takes me longer to pick up steps. Yeah, I noticed that freestyle is something like I could do better than like picking up steps and doing it in a specific order. It's really difficult, right? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I, I snap a picture, I have it, you know, and I'm like, well, wow, that was before. They were already internet famous, but they're yeah. not millionaires, you know, and now they right, right, won right. World of Dance two years ago or three years ago. Pretty amazing, right? So that's kind of my dance story. You know? Yeah, you never know, right? Because yeah. everybody starts somewhere, right? Yeah. And then there's this breakthrough moment and... The twins, I mean, it was only a matter of time. I mean, yeah. those, those guys are like insane, <laughs> yeah. right? I, I mean, they, they live on a different planet in terms of dance. Like, because they also do it, and you can probably relate because you have a twin, but they, they you know, like the way they communicate, they, yeah. they know each other so well. So when they battle, mm -hmm. the guy in the background, the other twin is also like doing stuff that 
adds to the storytelling of the brother right it's right. like un unbelievable so <laughs> yeah i was like glad that i was able to meet them and um yeah they look tall but they're actually tall you know they're <laughs> like good like half a foot taller and, you know, yeah it's crazy so when they come into the dance studio you you knew oh royalty is in here yeah. <laughs> so yeah so that's kind of my dance story i did um i did combat later on so mm -hmm. when i was at dreamworks i started kung fu for six months but then i really noticed it's just not for me and i i kept just like my heart was in dance because music yeah. ma makes me move right so i want to ask you about that because our mutual friend andre Rodriguez, yes. he mentioned that um like what is your philosophy around learning stuff because he was t talking about how you did martial arts and you did it really good well and then you just like st st stopped and you're like even your teachers were like what why are you stopping <laughs> so what is your idea with like learning and then letting go oh I, I love that question so um one so people talk about talent right and a lot of people say like oh Gory, you're so talented you know you have like this god-given skill and i'm like no i don't i'm just <laughs> like a maniac in learning <laughs> so like when i so basically my mom used to tell me like you know we're not a very talented family i don't know why she always said that but she was <laughs> like hey we're not very naturally talented but uh -huh. what i see in you is your talent lies in persistency that you stick to something and you persevere until you get to what you want mm -hmm. right and that's what i consider is your secret power that you don't do not let go until you get what you want right mm -hmm. so um and she was really right about that i mean i don't let go until i get to a certain level and if i don't like something i drop it right because it it, it feels like it's useless to put time into that and yeah. The first time I experienced that was music. I really tried, right, to... I played piano, and I played average, right? I played trumpet, but I saw my brother, and he was, like, so far ahead that I was like, I, I can't dedicate my life to this so much, like my brother does, because my brother would practice, like, four hours a day, you know, just because he wanted to. Yeah. And I had to force myself to practice. So I knew that there's a disconnect there. If I have to force myself to practice, then I don't like the process. If I don't like the process, I don't like to play. Yeah. What I want is I want the skill for free, but that's <laughs> just, you know, wishful thinking. That doesn't happen, right? Yeah. So um, the same happened with Kung Fu because I was like, I want to be able to do backflips and those kicks and, you know, and like I want to be able to defend myself. I want... I want to do all the, you know, Kung Fu moves and, you know, how to use the, the bow and stuff like yeah. that. I want to learn all that, you know. But then I realized I only wanted it for free. Because mm -hmm. once I started practicing, you know, the first month was okay. You know, like I, like the Shifu, my Shifu put me in the corner and he said, do, do this move like over and over again, right? Yeah. So classic, right? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like in the back back of the class i'm not even like in allowed in the gym i'm outside at the t in patio and i'm just like practicing practicing he's like good okay next next one and um you come into class and then basically uh, he taught me stretches and also you know uh, kung fu basics right yeah but then we enter month two and then i'm working and then i'm like okay i have class tonight and i'm like ah, <laughs> do i want to go and that's when it starts, right? Because mm -hmm. if you love something, you should, it shouldn't be a question. You just right. go. And I used to go to breakdance knowing it's in San Francisco, right? But this was in Belmont. So it's like a 15 minute drive. <laughs> it's very close, right? Yeah. So I'm just like, and then that got worse. Every week it's like, uh, yeah, but I'm paying for it. So I don't want to skip. So I go there, but I'm not fully invested in my heart, right? Yeah. And then um, sometimes we got one-on-one -on -one lessons where people wouldn't show up and he just destroyed me because I was good at what I did because of breakdance and stuff. I was conditioned, you know, so I had good endurance and stuff like that and body control from dance, right? Mm -hmm. So he thought I'm a really good student. But I was like, okay, I can pick this up pretty fast, but I don't, I'm not enjoying the process at all, yeah. right? So more and more that came to surface. So I was able to do what they were telling me, blocking, blocking, throwing and stuff like that, all the moves and how to roll out of a throw and stuff like that. But there's always this thing nagging like you don't enjoy this, you know? Yeah. So at some point I basically went to my Shifu and said like, hey, um, I decided I'm gonna stop 
um, Kung Fu. And he said, why? You're so good. And I'm like, I said, like, it's not about if I'm good or not. It's more about it, can I invest like my whole heart into this? Yeah. And I feel like I'm not honest to you because I feel currently it's like a burden for me to come to class. It has nothing to do with how you teach. It's yeah. just how I feel about combat. Yeah. It's just not for me. Right. Yeah. I thought it could be, but I realized now I tried it, that it is not. Yeah. My heart is in dance. Right. And he respected that. And mm -hmm. that's how I stopped. Right. But um, so there I didn't get even to that obsessive learning behavior with um, breakdance. I did, but only to a certain degree. So I feel like passion comes in like different levels. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, with animation and painting, the level is off the roof for me, yeah. you know, where it, it never died. The flame never dies. I want to learn more and more and more. And that was since childhood, right? Since we yeah. created those special effects with those, <laughs> you know, photos and stuff. So that's something that is like always dear to my heart. Mm -hmm. So I always have endless fuel to push into that. Um, yeah. For breakdance, because I was at an age where, you know, now I'm like 42, right? So, so I still try, but you, I have to be a bit more careful because yeah. <laughs> breakdance is very physical. You know, yeah. it's for a reason it's called breakdance. You know, like it's, <laughs> it's literally, I had some injuries through that as well, you know, so, and you don't recover as fast anymore. <laughs> so um, try to do it still, but not mm -hmm. seriously. And yeah. I got to a point, my goal for breakdance was I want to be able to nail the windmill. That was like the one thing I want to do this. And with flair, I tried it too, the way, where you just swing the legs around and you're only on your hands, right? Yeah. But, but that was like, I realized instantly, this is too much strain on my wrists. Yeah. So I don't want to risk it. But windmill, I actually got to a point where I nailed it, right? So I don't know if I can do it now because breakdance is like, um, it's not like biking. If you lose yeah. the muscle, you can't physically do those moves anymore, you know? Right, so right. it's very disappointing if you take a six months break and all of a sudden the moves that you could do yeah. just don't work because you know how the mechanics work but you don't have the muscle to do yeah. it right? so um yeah so for me once i did the windmill and dre saw it you know i did it in the morning <laughs> and i think my best was like eight rounds you know um eight propellers that i never was able to get it get into the windmill from a standing position mm -hmm. i always go from the ground position and rotate into it you know yeah. but that was good enough for me mm -hmm. where i felt like hey i was able to master this you know and that felt like an impossible move to do when i started right? yeah. so um and miles my teacher said like how many times do you practice a day right now and i'm like three times he said that's not enough like if you want to learn the windmill you have to do at least five times a week at least right give it at least half an hour right mm -hmm. but your body needs to learn this like three days you you can't figure out the body mechanics and yeah. i'm like okay i'm gonna do this so five days a week i would practice sometimes on the weekends as well you know mm -hmm. so and that's how i nailed it right so um that's where the obs obsessive practice came in you know same yeah. with handstands handstands i practice every day and i was able to do it eventually right and um to me i realized early on is to acquire skill mm -hmm. you need to put the time into it yeah you need to practice you will never get stuff for free right yeah so you need to work to get skill and um you can only put in work if you have passion for it because if you're not fully invested in it, it will block you from learning. And if it blocks you from learning, you don't um, experience success enough. And then you get more failures and then that might depress you and that might, might make you stop, right? Yeah. In my case, it's more like, you know, like with Kung Fu, I lost interest. So it was not like I reached a physical barrier. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel the passion. So I stopped because I knew that this is useless to go into this if I don't really want it. You know, yeah. I only wanted like Neo style. To, I know <laughs> Kung Fu, you know, and that doesn't work that way. Right. So um, with breakdance, I was willing to do that, to go that mile. And I managed to do this. Right. And now for animation and painting, that sense sensation is supercharged. Right. Yeah. Like I love the process so much that I there's no way I want to stop, regardless yeah. how much I fail. Right. And um, one technique I use that works really well as you know you, there's ways to practice you mm -hmm. know and sometimes you have to practice for hours yeah. for for example piano or gymnasts you have to like spend a lot of hours i spend a lot of hours into breakdance learning how to paint is almost like learning how to write right like it's mm -hmm. it's much faster because you don't have to physically train your body you you train your brain to understand yeah. 
So same animation takes hours actually, but I'm um, painting. There's a good thing you can do is that you can do short training sessions, right? Yeah. So short training sessions are much easier to uh, much easier investment than long, long, long sessions. Like learning animation takes a lot of dedication and yeah. time. Learning how to draw and paint. If you draw every day for half an hour, you will get better, mm -hmm. right? But you have to do it every day, right? So what I did early on in 2003, I actually started painting way late in the game. So mm -hmm. I, because I knew I wanted to become an animator. So coming back actually after high school, I went to a 3D animation school. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's where I basically knew Pixar. DreamWorks or Disney is where I'm going to infinity and beyond, right? Yeah. So that's like that's that's where I'm going to be. There yeah. was like no question. So I spent hours on end in learning animation. Started with 2D animation in school. It was a three-year program, and then Maya, then three, XSI, Software Mesh XSI, 3D Studio Max, and Lightwave, right? So those are the software packages we learned at school, mm -hmm. and. Um, Basically, there was the only 3D animation school specialized on 3D animation in Germany. And it was a private school, too. And um, so it was fairly expensive. It was $40,000 for three years, which sounds dead cheap here in the States, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> because you pay that even for a term. But in Germany, that was unheard of because yeah. Germany is mostly state universities, so it's free, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, just to segue a little bit to gain that money because I wanted it so bad, but I knew that my parents said like, oh, hell no, we yeah. don't, we can't support you with that. But your, your um, grandma has some savings for you, you know, mm -hmm. and she was deceased and she had some college savings and that paid like, I think three quarters of what I needed, right? Mm -hmm. Which was like really great. And they said like, hey, cost of living, you know, uh, we, we pay for you, you know, but you still have to come up with like ten, fifteen thousand dollars, right? And that was like I had like hundred bucks on my account, you know, as a and I know you started a company. Yes. Doing research. Nice. <laughs> so yeah, so that comes actually to back to your question about dedication, right? Because yeah. I wanted it so bad. So I'm like, I can't get this right now. So what what actions can I take to get there? Okay, I need fifteen thousand dollars. How do I gain this, right? I am straight out of high school, so I don't know how to <laughs> come up with money. I, I haven't studied anything. I knew I want to learn animation. So this is my next goal. This is my immediate goal, right? So how do I get there? I need money. How do I get money? Let's start a company, right? Mm -hmm. So, so um, with my friend, a friend of mine that I knew from dance, uh, one thing I left out in dancing is I was also dancing rock and roll for three years. Nice. So um, it's like a couple's dance, right? Yeah. And and it's very like um, athletic too, you know. So mm -hmm. I, uh, is it like the swing or? I, it, almost, yeah, yeah. It's more higher kicks than swing, though. You know, mm -hmm. like uh, but very similar. It's mm -hmm. very similar kind of like movements and stuff like that. Just the kicks are much higher, you know. Yeah. And then uh, acrobatics are more higher as well than swing dancing. Mm -hmm. Swing looks more like um, really fun dance versus like rock and roll is a little bit more acrobatic, right? Nice. So it's, it's a mixture between swing and gymnasts, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I was doing that and there was um, a guy that I met there who I became really close friends with and um, he was like this super um, smart hardware engineer as well, you know, so he would build his little robotics, buying chipsets and stuff like that. And we started a company because he, he liked what I did and we we're like, hey, we can do web design together, you know, mm -hmm. web design gets like a lot of money, you know, so we started and then let's start with um, selling computer hardware and then we dive into like web design later and then yeah. we started building you know, custom computers for people and quickly realized that we're only making like 40 bucks a month from that. <laughs> so it's like, it was like, come on, you know, per, per sale, we make like 40 extra bucks. And it was like, this is not scalable. Yeah. So also through the rock and roll club, um, he found, he talked to someone um, whose friend had a company that he just started it was an investment funds company. Mm -hmm. And um, basically they wanted to create like the stock marketplace, easy to buy, like this, this stock platform and I didn't know anything about, right? And then he said, hey, they need a PHP programmer. Can you, can Goro do this? Because like Florian, my business partner, he, he had like, he was still studying, I think, and he didn't have time. So mm -hmm. 
And he's like, Goro, this is our opportunity. You know? And I'm like, I don't know PHP. He's like, I can teach you a bit. And you know, this is similar to HTML and HTML, you know, you know, so you can learn this there. And I'm just like, oh, I need the money. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> so then I started like at this investment funds company coding like PHP investment fund forms. Yeah. So like how you can type in like like strings into a form and stuff like that. This is a checkbox and I wrote all the functions, you know, and I, it was like so hard for me because I'm not a coder, you know, and like another thing I don't have passion for, but I want to be able to do. Right. Like, so I have my JavaScript and HTML books. I had those, but then after I learned like for a day, I'm just like, screw this. I don't want to do this. <laughs> right? So, but then there was my, was my job. So I had to like really do this and yeah. I'm just like, I'm miserable, but I'm making money, right? So I think we made like, I think we made $24,000 in a year, which was like a lot for yeah. us, you know? And, um, but then while I was there, they talked to me like, yeah, you also know how to graphic design, right? And I'm like, well, I didn't go to school. I have, I, uh, I mean, I <laughs> think I have a good sense for graphics, you know? <laughs> and then um, they bought me a Photoshop license, right? Nice. And then um basically there i started redesigning some icons on the website that turned into like revamping the whole website you know and then that turned into like creating um conference booths right mm -hmm. and all the prints on the sides banners and even logos of their um little um they created like a new brand logo and they needed a new brand logo and they're like goro we have like this company that does it for us but you can do this yeah. and i'm like <laughs> crazy so and that's when i had to also call uh, have my calls with like print companies and stuff talking yeah. about like pantone codes and cmyk yeah. and all that stuff and i was a very introvert guy right like i was like very like i don't want to talk on phones with strangers i didn't want to get introduced me to too, strangers right? <laughs> so that was terrifying for me when they said just call the company just call them now and then the boss is in there and then just say N now can i can i finish this written? do it just now man i i'm here i can also answer questions and i'm just like now i'm on the spot and i'm just saying oh this is goro Fujita from that phone 24 you know i have a question about this friend and i'm just like oh this is like horrible i want to get out of here right <laughs> but then um they gave me more and more like visual tasks even mm -hmm. if it was an investment funds company and then they needed like a hardcore php coder and i knew my high school friend johannes kopf who is like who was like, like my brother in music, he was in coding. So he was in the computer class in, in high school and he would be like the top all the time without really practicing and learning because he knew everything about coding, right? Yeah. Fun fact, he works at Meta with me together, like nice. at the same company. It's crazy, right? Like the same high school in Germany. And then uh -huh. we, we actually built video games together early on, like the very small ones. Uh -huh. And then now, like 20 years later, we're like, at the same company again you know in a different country so that's that's another interesting coincidence uh, or is it but you know <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um yeah so so i we hired him and he mm -hmm. just took over all the coding and stuff like that and i was able to dedicate myself completely towards graphics so after that year i had the fifteen thousand right to cover so i basically told my business partner hey i have to jump ship right and he said yeah i knew this is like your objective you know i'm mm -hmm. gonna take this company further i think it still exists actually so yes. he's still running it as a consulting firm and stuff and then yeah that's when i started uh, at the german film school for digital production that was the full name of the uh, school uh, in elstal near, near berlin and mm -hmm. that's where i started back in 2022 I was um, 25 years old 2002? at that time. 2002? You said 2022. Uh, oh, yeah, 2002. Yeah, 2022 <laughs> is like this year. Yeah, I just started. <laughs> <laughs> Sophomore year, a junior year. No, um, yeah, yeah, 20. Yeah, 2002. Yeah, I'm so used to saying 20, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so that was a three years program. I learned how to animate in 2D and 3D, you know, and um, my objective was, so that was my big objective. Now I had that checked, right? Yeah. Next objective, Pixar, right? So everybody said, are you crazy, man? Like, how do you even get there? And I'm like, well, you know, of course it requires a lot of dedication and practice, but do never forget the people that are there, yeah. like Victor Navone. Mm -hmm. They started somewhere, 
I'm starting somewhere. Yeah. I think it's possible, right? <laughs> so that's when I started like really dedicating myself to animation. But in the second, second year, 2000, no, third year, 2004, I would say, um, is when I met Stefan Strelting. Um, mm -hmm. He was two years below me and he was a guy who painted in Photoshop. He was really good, right? Mm -hmm. A concept artist. And I'm like, whoa, this is crazy. And like, well, how did you do this? And he said, oh, I use this Wacom tablet. And I'm like, it's tablet. Like, I, I paint with a mouse. You know, it's easier. And he's like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> no, the tablet is way better. And he said, trust me on this. Yeah. Like, really learn how to use the tablet. And because we had tablets at the school. It was a pretty modern school. It was still the beige colored ones, the red yeah. markers. And then <clears throat> that's when I painted something and, and you know, and forced myself to use the Wacom tablet. And oh, yeah, I guess you have more control than a mouse. <laughs> yeah. <Yes>. And then <laughs> I was like showing my painting to um to stefan you know i was kind of proud of it and i'm like hey so here is my painting can you give me some feedback and he said um and he said okay hmm where do i start and he said um so what's your objective and i'm like i don't want to be able to paint like you you know like i want to be able to utilize this in my arsenal of creation right mm -hmm. i want to learn how to paint and he said okay honest or I, can I be honest? And he's I mean, yeah, yeah, hit me, hit me. And I, I need this. And he's like, okay, to be honest, I don't know where to start because you're pretty much doing everything wrong. <laughs> right? So you, you don't have any foundations. So mm -hmm. you don't know how to use light and color. You don't know much about composition. You know, no, you don't know how to draw, you know, mm -hmm. and I thought I could draw. I thought I'm good at composition because I had a natural sense for it. But, but when you take it to a professional level, it was still very beginner level. Right? And he's like, and storytelling lacks like what is this what are you trying to say with this and it's just this this female monk sitting on this rock in front of a waterfall but how do, does this environment relate to the character and i'm just like oh shit <laughs> <laughs> i'm like um okay and i'm like okay i accept your critique tell me what am i supposed to do and he's like yeah. you need to practice man he's like this is just like you need to practice i i can't even mentor you if you're at this level right now right so basically he taught me half an hour a day mm -hmm. you know learn from life or reference images try to if you try to learn how to if your objective is to learn how to paint light and color which it was mm -hmm. try to just look at the pictures and repaint them without picking the colors from the photo so try to understand why the shirt looks blue although it's white why it has a purple tint in it mm -hmm. how are the local colors being influenced by light right and yeah. i'm like okay interesting so that's when i started my speed painting journey back in april 2000 in march 2004 mm -hmm. um where i started daily paintings for um at least a year i think mm -hmm. i got to like 365 days consecutive days but basically I started doing half an hour a day and half an hour is very important. So an hour is fine, mm -hmm. but um, half an hour to an hour, but not longer. And the reason is because if you spend longer on a painting, you start to cover up your mistakes. Yeah. If you stop where you cannot at a time where you can't have time to fix your mistakes, then you expose your mistakes so you can learn from them. Right? Yeah. So you fail quickly in mm -hmm. short, short increments. Mm -hmm. And then you can fix your mistakes, right? So <clears throat> I I had like this hourglass, which was exactly 30 minutes. So I put it in and then I draw, right? And then I stop, regardless how shitty the image looked, I stop mm -hmm. and save it and number it consecutively, right? So I've been doing this and after 60 days, I hit my first mile milestone where I drew something and then I asked... I always like I didn't bother Stefan for the first month, right? But then, you know, every now and then I get critiques from him. He's like, no, go back. You have to mm -hmm. work more, right? And then um, the, the images that I painted from reference were really good because, mm -hmm. they, you know, I get the colors fairly right. But then whenever I do something from imagination, it looks yeah. like garbage, right? Yeah. So um, after painting 60, I think it was around that I painted and showed it to... Um, Stefan and he looked at me and he said did you use the reference and I'm like I didn't and he said interesting <laughs> I'm like now I can start mentoring you because now I can actually see your mistakes it's not all wrong you're doing actually a lot of 
things right right okay. so um that's when i had my 15 minute sessions like you know on a daily basis he would critique uh, other when when i do reference i wouldn't bother him but every time i do something personal i would just sit in 15 minutes with him he do does paint overs for me and stuff you know and then um that's how i learned and then mm -hmm. um i ended up doing this for a long time um it's hard to be consecutive. So I have to admit, after the first year, I did miss like a week or two sometimes, right? Yeah. But I always found my way back. Mm -hmm. And the reason is when I started, so I was always dedicated to do it every day until to a point where I felt comfortable. Hey, I re reached a level mm -hmm. where I can relax a little bit, you know? Yeah. And um, that's when, when I was like already fairly good at painting, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that's when I, let loose a little bit but then i picked it up again because i'm like okay i'm recharging a little bit and then now i'm gonna go to the next level right yeah. and then i would then do another 300 days consecutively and stuff like that right so the consecutive practice is extremely important mm -hmm. because you constantly have to think about your mistakes you constantly get faced with failures right but then mm -hmm. you also have an opportunity to fix them the next day mm -hmm. so you do these micro steps that you really don't notice you're improving but yeah. then by numbering the paintings consecutively mm -hmm. after 30 days if you look back to painting one you do see a difference if yeah. after like 300 days and you look at painting 60 you see a huge difference while you do this you don't notice because you're constantly working right so um that's when i also got exposed to internet like mm -hmm. um, sharing so um, i was part of this underground forum called sijun which was mm -hmm. a, a very popular back then among artists craig mullins the mm -hmm. master of digital art he was posting their uh, spooch demon that was his, his name and um, a lot of friends like now friends used mm -hmm. to post them that i looked up to you know which is like really cool and then of course there was cg talk as well right yeah. so and cg talk was more 3d oriented but i was also in the speed painting forum and stuff like that um really like you know putting all my art, art out there yeah. so that's how a lot of my friends that i know now that are art directors and production designers uh, senior people they know me from back then and because yeah. they've seen my dedication when i ask them for advice down the line or for a recommendation letter right for my green card and stuff like that or for yeah. my visa it wasn't a question for them to help me because they knew who i was they knew yeah. that i was serious about it right because mm -hmm. i painted every single day and they actually seen my progression mm -hmm. so they knew this guy this guy is dedicated he might not be good right now, but mm -hmm. he wants to be good, right? Mm -hmm. So by the time I got the respect, that's when I started working professionally as an artist, right? So that was like also important to showcase your art, mm -hmm. regardless if it's bad. If you're learning, it's beneficial if you show it. Unfortunately, forums and stuff are not as popular anymore. And now it's all yeah. about Instagram and stuff. But by getting comments or not getting comments, it's kind of like a good, good benchmark, right? Like yeah. where you're at, because when I came out of high school, I thought I was, I was the shit, you yeah. know? but I wasn't at all. Right? And then I got punched in the face in college because there was a bunch of people better than me, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, oh, you know, I actually have to work. Right? And then I met Stefan and I'm like, oh my God, I don't know anything. Right. Mm -hmm. And then I still feel like that, but it humbled me. Right. Because it's yeah. like, yeah, you're, you're not it's not it you know you, everybody tries to be the best version of themselves but you have to like work on it right and yeah so that's that's when i did the daily paintings and still do now mm -hmm. i call them the daily quillustrations yeah. and i'm closing in to taking over my painting number so i stopped painting daily mm -hmm. at 1500 so i did 1500 paintings and um Today, I was, before this call, I was actually working on a daily um, illustration now in VR, uh, which is my 1,300 second painting, right? Nice. So, so I'm getting close, you know, mm -hmm. um, this year, do I reach it this year? No, I don't think there's so many days left, but next year I will basically surpass the 2D um, paintings. Right? I think um, like all that you're saying with your learning journey, that's why, so, like similar to you, I didn't find uh, 3D animation as a career to my senior year of high school. Um, but also, I'm pet. Like I like to. I remember I was. T uh, I met a, 
a father uh, last weekend at a conference, and he was saying how his daughter was interested in like animation and stuff like that. And something that, from personal experience of t tutoring a guy, trying to get kids to, tr uh, like, at least as a hobby, do like animation, or if they like, oh, I play video games, I want to make video games. But then I remember I tutored a guy, and he ended up going to college to um, study animation, and then he, that's when he realized he didn't want to make video games. Hmm. And I'm like, oh man, you, you like trying to talk to parents like. You can save a lot of money if you try to get them to do it now and then realize now that they don't actually want to do it. Because I feel yeah. like the video game thing is kind of similar to like the NBA where like people think because they play basketball that they want to be in the NBA. But yeah. then you realize that you either don't have the work ethic or you just don't actually want to work that. Like yeah. you don't want to be in the NBA. So I feel like um, before parents spend money on college, like... There's free resources. Try to get your child to do it yeah, now that's so the, they can see now that they don't actually want to, they just want to play video games. <laughs> so the huge advantage of social media now is that resources are all out there, right? Mm -hmm. When I was growing up, it was literally VHS, learning Michael Jackson dance move from a VHS. <laughs> learning Maya, that was a trip, you know, to, like, there was no YouTube. Yeah. Right. So I knew a guy who knew a guy. Right. So that's also how I got Maya because Maya was only enterprise licenses. You know, mm -hmm. how do I get to Maya? Right. Yeah. And then I knew a guy at, who studied at the art school in Germany and at, who happens to be the brother of Johannes, who is the coder. You know, <laughs> that is, it's crazy. And then basically um, his name is Robert. And basically he was kind of like short term my mentor for Maya because he was like one of the only people that I knew that actually use Maya you know yeah. but that was my Maya release too that was before paint effects came out right mm -hmm. so it's like old school right and and I think that was right after it was like it changed from alias power animator to Maya you know yeah. so um yeah so back then like it was my dedication that led the way but these days Gen X kids are jaded, right? Because they have everything available to them, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like, in Germany, it's still cheap to go to school. But here in the U.S., it's a risk, right? Like, if yeah. you spend so much money. In Germany, yeah. the good thing is, financially, it's not really a risk, you know? <laughs> it's like, if you if you drop out and you find something else, then do it, you know? Like, mm -hmm. just, just find a way to live. But here, you, you have student debts and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, absolutely. And I think... You know, there's a lot of stuff you can learn from, like you can, you can be self-taught, you know, through mm -hmm. YouTube. It really doesn't matter where you come from and what, what matters is what you can do, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're like super dedicated, you don't really need to go to school, right? Mm -hmm. And especially in these days, you can learn everything online. However, what I do say about school, because people ask me like, do I have to go to a school to be good? I say, no, you don't. If you have dedication and the passion, to really and the discipline to learn, you don't. But what a school does is it puts you in a very competitive environment mm -hmm. and gives you tasks that you wouldn't give to yourself maybe otherwise. Yeah. And it might open up doors to, like, to areas that you have never dreamt of going towards, right? And that happened to me multiple times, actually, because I learned 3D, right? Mm -hmm. But if I didn't go to college, I wouldn't have met Stefan. So I m might have never gotten to DreamWorks to do the visual development, right? Mm -hmm. So all those things, like, that's what school does. It creates yes. network and you an environment that, that you can thrive in, right? Yeah. And um, if you're alone, you could still get network through Discord or like through art forums and stuff, but it's different, right? Yeah. And so um, in that sense, I think school is valuable. but. Mm -hmm. One important thing that I always tell my students is that the school is not going to make you a good artist. It's you. Yeah. So when we had open doors in our school, it was like $40,000 school in Germany. That sounds outrageously expensive, right? So we had the open door. And then, they, do you say an open door? It's like an open day when people can come and visit the school. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how you call it. In, in German, <laughs> you call it open door. That's why I directly translated. But uh -huh. like this open, like, like a, if, um, a, just like a college tour. Or yes, something. exactly. Where, where people can come. It's a dedicated day, though, where yeah, parents yeah. can come and talk mm -hmm. to the students, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there was a dad, like a father, who came to me and he's like, hey, so if I spend my money, is he guaranteed to have a job? 
after this? And I'm like, no, absolutely not. If your son comes here and doesn't give a shit and doesn't work, mm -hmm. obviously he doesn't have a job after right. that. But if he comes here, it's really dedicated and works really hard. 100% he will get a job. And he's like, oh, okay, that makes sense. You know, <laughs> so, so, you know, like that, that's like this. People think they can get skill for free, you know, yeah. but the school can only offer an environment where you can thrive, but you have to be responsible to thrive, right? <laughs> like, like if you, and we had people that just like lean back and not doing anything. They just smoke all day, you know, and they don't help their teammates and mm -hmm. they weren't as successful after that, you know, and, but that's obvious, right? Yeah. So I do say like, you know, I heard from a blue sky animator that she was a lifeguard before, you know, and then became an animator. So all of those stories exist, right? Yeah. And, and Dre's story is inspiring, you know, mm -hmm. growing up in Marysville, you mm -hmm. know, and or Tyree, you know, I saw you were yeah. like, we were actually blog friends. Like nice. I never met Tyree, but we had a lot of like conversations through blogger back then, you know, mm -hmm. and I saw on your channel that he had, you had him as a guest. So I was like, oh, Really, that's awesome, right? <laughs> and he had a very different past from me, you know. So, so has yeah. Dre, but we ended up in the same industry, right? Mm -hmm. So, it really comes down to you, dedication. So, it's also not about like I want to be like X, Y, Z. Yeah. You have to be the best version you can be, right? And only that way you can make yourself unique yeah. and on par with other industry giants, right? Mm -hmm. So, um. Yeah, so practice is key. It sounds mm -hmm. simpler than it's done, like easier said than yeah. done, right? Um, because practice, if you don't love the process, right, you're not gonna get good that's, at it. And that's you know? what I'm trying to get to. Like, well, first I want to mention, like, because of my platform, I have like people who just graduated from college reach out yeah. to me and like show me their work, and I'm like, you just spent four years <laughs> to, to come out with work that looks like that. I don't yeah. tell them that, but that's yeah, yeah. my inside thought, and I'm like, ooh. You have a, a long way to go. Yeah. And and then for me, my personal college experience of, um, like, for the first two years, I kind of, like, you know, did my assignments. And this was for all my classes, not just for my animation classes. But then my second two years, I was like, I want to, like, do all my projects. I, I did all my projects about race uh, and gender because... Like, I would be part of, like, the Black Awareness Coordinating Committee, and we have all these events where we want to talk about race with, like, white people, and they would never come. <laughs> so mm. I was like, I want to know what white people think. And so mm. they're in my class, and they have to participate, so let me do all my projects on race nice. so I know what they think. <laughs> and so my junior year and senior year, I, like, very concentrated, like, all my projects, whether it was, like, visual anthropology or a psychology like social science class or my animation classes i would concentrate on race because i'm like i really want to know what they think and i'm not trying to like bait anybody i just want yeah. to, like they don't come to our events so i'm like yeah. let me learn what they think which some of it was really dumb but, <laughs> <laughs> but like at least i know that now and yeah. so i feel like taking your your learning into your own hands like i did it in a different way but like even with art like trying to figure out your own style or like, like like following what your professor is telling you to do but then taking it further not doing the bare minimum yeah no absolutely like that's the thing right you have to love the process and art is about the process you know mm -hmm. and um and yeah like um i'm i exactly relate to you with like um when you do portfolio reviews or animation demo reel reviews i still do animation reviews as well because i'm, I'm not like the greatest animator but i know what i'm talking about i've been yeah. in the industry right so i can comment on stuff you know like from an objective or subjective point of view but i i can use my experience to give feedback but i don't sugarcoat things right yeah. so i like i see a lot of like um fellow artists that just say like yeah that's awesome you will get to your goal one day you yeah know? but no no i'm not like that right like i'm i'm known as being savage you know <laughs> so like it was funny i was at ctn um i think that was 2018 i always do some portfolio reviews at my um booth as well right and then one guy came from um like I, I gave feedback, right? And then, and, but I, I'm not like evil or something. I'm just yeah. like saying how it is, right? And then I was like, and who else did your portfolio review? And he said, Pascal Campion. And I'm like, oh, he's, he's pretty savage, right? And he said, well, you're not that either. <laughs> 
<laughs> because Pascal is also very like very direct, you know. Yeah. But what what I say is, you know, like I look at the stuff, for example, our portfolios, and I say like, hey. So then, like, yeah, I don't find a job. Like I I apply to like fifty companies and they don't even reply. And I'm like, okay, looking at your portfolio, I understand why, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not ready. That's right. that's simply said. But it doesn't mean you can't be ready, right? Mm -hmm. It means you have to put more time into it. They say, yeah, but I I'm already graduating. I mean, it doesn't matter because graduating <laughs> doesn't mean you're good. You know? right. <laughs> so so I said like you have to practice fundamentals, and I point stuff out, you know, and I talk talk to them about the daily practice, you know, and really target your weaknesses, you know, yeah. because I can see you can draw, but you have no idea about how to use light and color, mm -hmm. and I think that's lacking, and that's actually overpowering your lack of experience it's overpowering your experience actually yeah. so that's ending up hurting you and they're like yeah but i need money so i need a job and i'm like yeah so be it like <laughs> find a job and she said yeah but that's what i'm trying to do and i like, no, you're trying to find an art job right <laughs> find any job right he said well should i be waiting tables or what and i'm like yes why not right i'm like i didn't like computer hardware sales to get to where I want to be, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes you have to pave your own way. If there's a brick wall, mm -hmm. try to find a way around it, right? So life is not as easy. If it was that easy, everybody would have a job. Mm -hmm. What I'm telling you right now, would I hire you? Absolutely not, mm -hmm. right? And I'm telling you straight up just because it's not that I don't like you. It's just mm -hmm. not skilled enough. Mm -hmm. But if you were skilled, I might hire you, right? <laughs> so that's how simple it is. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, you know. And, and you know, like sometimes I did make people cry sometimes. And I'm like, hey, 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 you know, like yeah. this is not meant to be like, I'm not bashing you or anything. Right. I just don't want you like sugarcoat your work and let you leave with a wrong impression. Because the reason why you don't get calls is just simply because you're not skilled enough. But it never means that you will never be skilled enough. Right. It's just I like, put more work into it and it will happen because do you think I got landed in an animation job right away? No, I didn't. Yeah. Do you think I thought like I could be a visual development artist? That wasn't even an option for me. Mm -hmm. I slid into that, right? right? Which is a good segue into DreamWorks because 